Welcome to the Church of Columbus. I feel so blessed, personally, so blessed and grateful to be here, and, and we're glad that you are here this morning. Amen? Well, I thought I was going to sing. Uh, I, I can't think of a better place I, I would rather be, perhaps uh, short of heaven, maybe, but I have to die to go there, so here we are, best place this side of heaven. Um, I'm grateful this morning to Pastor Shepherd and the leadership of this church for giving me the opportunity to teach again. Um, I want to thank you all for being here on time. Everybody looks so studious and attentive this morning. Um, I'm grateful also for the Lord for giving us his word. Are you grateful for the word of God? Wow. Praise the Lord. The Bible says it's, it's salvation to us. This word of God is literally salvation. We wouldn't be able to be saved. We wouldn't make it to heaven without this word. It's fundamental to our lives. I want to thank God for this word. I want to thank him for helping me prepare this message for you. Amen. Um, we're still on the subject of tithes this morning. Uh, perhaps you've noticed I'm taking my time. Perhaps you've noticed I'm taking my time to talk about this because, as I mentioned in the very first lesson, I kind of want to conduct a very pragmatic, analytical study of what the Bible says about tithes. So you'll excuse me if it feels like maybe I'm, I'm being a little redundant or that I'm moving too slow, but, but I tell you what, I hope that by the end of these four lessons that I've moved so slow that you leave here with this information in your heart and in your mind, just absolutely sure why you do what you do. Praise the Lord. Today we're in the third of four lessons. I'm going to teach this in four lessons. This is the third, so we'll have one more. That'll be on April 11th after Easter um, that I plan on teaching on this topic. If you miss lesson one or lesson two, I'm, I'm going to highly encourage you to go to the church website or to go to the church's YouTube channel and catch up what you've missed, okay? Uh, could we get the first slide up there, my email? I told you all in the first lesson that I would give you guys my email address, and, and that is because if you have any questions on this topic, I want you, we, the, the leadership of this church wants you to ask those questions. We want to answer your questions. If there's anything that you've been wondering, perhaps questions that you've written down or maybe just pondered, uh, and they haven't been answered yet in the course of this lesson, would you please email them to me? I, I wish that you would, I, and, and I don't mind answering these questions. I would like, I would like that. Uh, this is a very important subject. So take a photo here of the screen or write this down. Uh, I promise if we, you send us questions, we're not going to put you on blast about the question you asked. If I end up using it next week and answering it, uh, for everybody's benefit, I'm not going to attribute it to you, okay? So you don't have to worry about that, amen? All right, uh, let's go to the next slide. This is my title slide, and, and as I said, we're talking about what does the Bible say about tithe? And as I've said each lesson so far, I'm trying to stick very closely to what the Word of God says about this subject because when you leave here today and when you leave here the next time we teach, I want you to leave here knowing what the Bible says, not just what... A preacher said, not just what a teacher said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so here's a summary of what we learned so far from Scripture. We've learned that tithes is 10% of all your increase. What this means to us today is that tithe is 10% of your gross pre-tax income, not your net. And simply, uh, simply put, your increase is any, uh, the Bible uses the word increase. It's 10% of all your increase. And your increase is simply any money that you receive that you did not already have. Very simple. This includes your, your paycheck. This includes Social Security or disability income. This includes gifts or windfalls of money, inheritance. It includes stimulus checks. Amen? 10% of, of all of that. The pre-tax gross figure of that. We also have seen biblically that it's God's people who pay tithes. And that makes sense because it's God that we're paying our tithes to. The Bible says that the tithes belongs to God. Now we're going to see today that God choose, there's something that God chooses to do with the tithes. But what God does with it, it does not diminish the fact that it's Him that we give the tithes to. Okay? The Bible also makes it clear that tithes should be paid in the house of God. 
It actually says in Scripture that God wants you to pay the tithes in a house that bears His name. What that means to us is that we should be paying our tithes today in a Jesus name church. And then the last thing we discussed last week, right at the end, was whether tithing was optional or obligatory according to Scripture. And, of course, we've seen that, in fact, uh, tithing is a biblical mandate that is still required of God's people today. We've seen that, uh, that people were paying tithes before the law, that they were paying tithes in Scripture during the time of the law. And then we also seen that people were still ba- paying tithes in the New Testament church. And that's where we are today. We are the New Testament church. We're actually going to get into a little bit more of that today. So yes, tithes is obligatory. It is, it is not optional for us. However, because of the love of God, because of the love of Jesus Christ and His Spirit that we now have access to today, now in this church age, we can give and we out of, out of an abundance of love and not just out of obligation. The reason that you're paying your tithes is not because you're afraid of of someone punishing you. That ought not to be the reason anyway. You give because you love God. So so when we are filled with that agape love, when we're filled with this Holy Ghost and we have that agape love living inside of us, that will become the impetus. That will become what compels us to serve and to give and to sacrifice. A spirit-filled Christian will give their tithes because they love God. And because they love his work here on this earth. Amen. All right. That was my summary. Let's go into answering our next question this morning. The next question is, what does God do with the tithes? What does God do with the tithes? So remember, the Bible tells us that we pay our tithes to God. We just said that. But what we're going to answer this morning is, what does God then do with the tithes that we bring to him? Let's go to Numbers 18. I'm going to read verse 21 and then verse 24 from chapter 18. Numbers 18, starting with verse 21, says, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. He's talking about the tithes of Israel, all the tenth. I've given the children of Levi all the tenths for an inheritance. And he's saying, I'm giving them this tithes for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let's go to verse 24 in the same chapter. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as a heave offering of to the Lord, God is saying, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. The book of Numbers tells us a lot about the work of these Levites. Verse 21 calls them the children of Levi. It's the same group here. And and the, the book of Numbers tells us a lot about their work. They were, they were priests, and they were the ministers of God unto the children of Israel. The Levites, in the broadest sense, is, were just those of the tribe of Levi. That's who the Levites were in the broadest sense. And Levi was one of the twelve tribes of Israel. And Levi was also one of the twelve sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Okay? Okay? So Levi, in the broadest, the Levites, in the broadest sense, was just someone who was of the tribe of Levi, of the 12 tribes of Israel. So actually Moses and his brother Aaron, we know who Moses is. We probably know who Aaron is. In case you don't, Aaron was Moses' brother. He was Moses' older brother, and he was actually the first high priest of Israel. But both of these fellows belonged to the tribe of Levi. They were Levites. So God chose from among these 12 tribes of Israel, the Levite tribe, to be the tribe that would serve as his priest and his ministers to all of Israel and eventually to the whole Jewish faith. As his ministers, we've just seen here, as God's ministers, as his workers, God chose to give them the tithe to support them. Verse 21 tells us that he's giving them the tithe because of the service that they're serving in the tabernacle there in the temple. There were distinct groups within the Levite tribe, that, uh, and each one of these groups within the Levite tribe had their own full-time ministerial duties. One group was called the Aaronites, and these were the direct descendants or the sons of Aaron, and they filled the traditional roles of the priests. They worked in the holy place, and they worked with the sacrifice. And then there was another group of Levites that... Uh, was responsible for music and for singing. 
There were Levites who were responsible to be the teachers and to be the uh, custodians, if you will, of, of the law of God. The Levites were in charge of all of the services, and they organized all of the religious festivals and, and, and uh, feasts in Israel. And then there was another responsibility that they had. You see, uh, back in the Old Testament, in the days of the tabernacle, that tabernacle, or their, their temple at the time, moved around the first iteration of a temple they had was a tabernacle that was uh well like a elaborate tent uh and and it god from time to time told them to pack up and move and so from time to time this whole tabernacle had to be taken down it had to be packed away transported and then it had to be reconstructed in a very precise sacred way which god had dictated it was the responsibility of the levites to to uh, to take care of this whole function of moving the tabernacle as well. Uh, one group had the responsibility for all of the curtains in the tabernacle, and there was a lot of curtains, and they were just sprawling. These made up the walls of the tabernacle. So there's one group that, that had the responsibility for all the curtains, and then another group had a responsibility for all the beams, the framework, if you will, of the tabernacle. And then there was another group that had a responsibility for moving all the furniture, the altar and the... The, the laver and, and the, show, the table of showbread, as well as all the utensils uh, and instruments. So these ministers that were in charge of the curtains, I'm just giving you a little background here, that these fellows were the ministers of God. They had, they had full-time jobs. The ones that were in charge of the curtains and the framework, whenever they got ready to move and pack these things up, they had ox and wagons that they could transport that stuff in. But those that were in charge of the furniture and the instruments, they had to carry all that stuff, as it were, by hand on their shoulder. God was very explicit about that, no matter how far the journey. So as God's ministers, what I'm saying is that the Levites were employed with the work and the responsibilities of the faith. That was their work. That was their job. Just like a farmer farmed for a living and just like a carpenter did construction for a living, uh, a cook cooks for a living and a seamstress or a tailor makes clothes for a living, ministry is what God had called the Levites to do for a living. And just like the farmer and just like the carpenter and the cook and the seamstress, the Levite ministers all had needs and they had families to support and they had bills to pay. So what would be their wage? And what would they be paid for their work? Numbers 18 and 21. God says, I'm going to give them the tithes for their service. Do we see that? God answers the question for us. I'm going to pay the Levites, my ministers, with the tithe. God paid them with the tithes. That was their income. Simple. Remember that we're answering the question, what does God do with the tithes that we bring him? This was God's system for providing for the ministry. And this system was then carried over into the New Testament, into this current church age. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 6 and read through verse 10. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 10. In this, uh, just to give you a little context, in this, in this passage we're about to read, Jesus is sending out his disciples. He's sending out his ministers on a mission here and he has something to say to them before they go starting in verse 6 Jesus says but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead cast out devils freely you have received freely give verse 9 Jesus says to them Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Jesus says, don't take your wallet with you. You won't need it. Nor script for your journey, neither two coats. Don't worry about extra clothes or shoes. Nor, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. This word meat here in the Greek refers generally to sustenance or provision. In Luke 10 and 7, Jesus says it another way. He says, for the labor is worthy of his hire. In the same sort of context as he's sending his disciples out. What's happening here? Jesus is sending out his disciples to preach and teach, to evangelize, to minister to people. And then he tells them, in verse 7, don't worry about bringing your own money to live on. We just read that. Silver, gold, brass. 
Because, why? They were to depend on those that they had converted. They were to depend on those to whom they were ministering to support them while they were on the mission, while they were out there ministering. This is what he means in verse 7 and again in Luke 10 and 7 when he tells them that the workman is worthy of his meat, that the labor is worthy of his hire. What work and labor were they doing? They were preaching and teaching. They were evangelizing, healing the sick, casting out devils. They were doing the work of the Lord. And so what then was their meat or their hire that they were worthy of receiving? It was the support of those that they were ministering to. Does that make sense? Let's keep going. Think about it. These first disciples of Jesus would go on to become the, the pioneers and the fathers of the New Testament church. We see them be taking the lead once Jesus is, is uh, resurrected and fills them with the Holy Ghost. We see them take the lead and, and become in the, church, in the church of the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament. They become the church leaders. So Jesus is trying to instill in them early on the principles and the practices by which he wanted his church to be administered. At the, he's trying to instill in them early on the way that he wants themselves to live. One of those principles was that the ministry would be supported by the church. Just like we've seen with the Levites in the Old Testament. The ministry would be supported by the church. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9 and 14. I'm going to read the next few verses out of the King James Version and the NLT. I have both uh, versions up here. 1 Corinthians 9 and 14. The King James Version says, Even so has the Lord ordained they which preach... The gospel should live of the gospel. This verse is very clear. The NLT says, In the same way, the Lord ordered those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. You see why I'm sticking to the Bible here? Sometimes talking about money around people is like lighting a match around gasoline. So I'm just going to stick to the Bible. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says they that preach, they that preach the gospel should be able to live by the preaching of the gospel. Should be able to be supported by those who are benefiting from the preaching, from the teaching. Just as we did, just as he did with his ministers in the Old Testament, God is still giving his ministers the ministry, the tithes, as income for the work that they're doing. Galatians 6 and 6. Again, I'm going to read it King James and NLT. Galatians 6 and 6 from the King James says, Let him that is taught in word, in the word, excuse me, communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. The word communicate here in the original Greek means to share or to disperse to. From the NLT, it gives us a little more modern language clarity. It says, Those who are taught the word should provide for their teachers. Sharing all good things with them. You see why I'm talking out of the Bible this morning. First Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Says, let the elders that rule well be worthy of double honor. Now, when we read that and the way that we use that word nowadays, we think, my first tendency is thinks about like a pat on the back when we give you honor. I'm going to hold the door for you. That might be part of it. But let me tell you, this word honor here actually means an honorarium. It's talking about a payment of money. You can look that up for yourself. This word means a payment of money. Let the elders that rule well be counted of, of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, verse 18, you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. We just heard that. Let's read it from the NLT, and it makes it very clear. Again, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well. Oh, it's not just talking about a pat on the back. Especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. Wow. 
in the New Testament, let me, let me clarify this whole muzzle the ox illustration. In the Old Testament, people were using ox to tread out their grain, and it was often very hard work. It was long hours for that ox. Now, evidently, there were people in cultures that would muzzle that uh, ox's mouth closed or put a piece of, uh, they still do this, actually, in some parts of the, in this part, some areas of this world, put a piece of uh, cloth, breathable cloth, over that ox's mouth so that he can breathe, but that he would not be able to eat as he worked. The, the, what they were worried about is they were worried about that ox eating into their profit while he was working for them and, and helping them make a profit. Because every now and then that ox would be able to lean down and lick up the grain or lick up the corn and sustain himself as he worked. So God told Moses in Deuteronomy that he did not want his people treating their ox that way with a muzzle. God made it a law that you could not muzzle an ox that was hard at work treading grain because that poor creature ought to be able to take care of his needs and to sustain himself while he worked for you. Paul uses the same principle twice in Scripture, the same, the same principle to stress that the ministers of God ought to be able to be financially supported and have their needs met while they're doing the work of God. And in the, in, in, it's the ties that God has chosen to support his ministers while they're doing his work. Now, which ministers and which jobs are we talking about precisely? Let's answer that. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. I'm going to read this from the NLT here. We commonly refer, refer to this group of ministers as the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. From the NLT, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Here are the gifts that he gave to the church. He gave the church apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility, it says in verse 12, is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, these are who we call the five-fold ministry. Uh, an apostle literally means one who is sent out, just to clarify some of these roles. An apostle literally means an emissary, a one who's sent out. So apostles are the ones who carry the gospel to those who, had never heard, who have never heard it. Missionaries fall into this classification of ministry. Prophets uh, are generally those who give themselves continually to prayer and fasting, to seeking the face of God. And occasionally the church is blessed and edified in hearing from these prophets concerning the mind and the will of God. Evangelists, in a, in a nutshell, are those who are responsible for spreading the gospel from house to house and from assembly to assembly. We have evangelists that have come through here. Uh, pastors and teachers are those who are responsible for the ongoing biblical instruction and the growth of the church. They impart and they safeguard biblical truth and doctrine. Pastors and teachers are the feeders of the flock of God, if you will. Now, the pastor in particular uh, is also the under-shepherd of God's flock. Okay, he's, he's the one that has been designated to lead the, the, at the local church level. And with this, with the way that the church is set up, it's the pastor who has the ultimate responsibility for the tithes. Because as we've seen in a previous lesson, you bring your tithes to the storehouse of God. And it just so happens to be the way the church is set up, the pastor is over that storehouse. Therefore, he's the one responsible for supporting and dispersing this tithe to the other's roles in the fivefold ministry as it's needed. When the evangelist comes through, you know how the pastor pays them? Out of the tithe. Okay? So this is the fivefold ministry. Apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These roles, the Bible says, are God's gift to the church. These individuals, the Bible says, are God's gift to the church. Right there, Ephesians 4 and verse 12. They are your ministers. You know what the word minister is? It's a fancy word for a servant. They're serving you, the kingdom of God. They're serving you salvation by the, by, uh, to which God has called them to do. They are your ministers. The Bible says they have the responsibility for the care of the church, for the building up of the church, for equipping the whole body of Christ. 
And just as you have an occupation and just as you have a job and a vocation for which you get paid, so also the ministry is the occupation or the vocation of the fivefold ministry. And how shall they be paid? How shall they be supported for the work that they're doing? The Bible says that the tithes is their income. I know that might, this might sound a little redundant this morning, but I want to take time in answering this question because I want you to see these scriptures. This is not my opinion. This is the Bible. 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says that the love of money, y'all know that one? The love of money is the root of all evil. This is why this subject of money can be so volatile, so sensitive sometimes. This is why some of us, even right now this morning, are squirming in our seats or maybe on the inside. It's a serious topic. When you come to God, you see, the world loves money. Oh, yes, they do. The world loves money. In fact, this carnal world is, is, is the, the carnal world system is kind of framed by money. You need money to almost get anything done in this carnal world. And so the love of money in this carnal world is almost inseparable. But when you come to God, the very first thing that he's going to test you with, the very first thing that he wants to, to, to make sure that you have in check is that you will stop loving that stuff from the world so much and you will channel your love and your trust and your confidence in him. Because the love of money, it says, is going to lead you down every sort of evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so this topic becomes, like I said earlier, like gasoline sometimes, very volatile. There are, there are a lot of people in the world and even in the church today who have become very skeptical of their support for the ministry. Oh, they still want you to preach and teach to them real good. They still want you to spend time in prayer and in study and make sure when you get up here that you speak right. They still want you to pray for them when they're sick. They want you to still be there when they have a crisis. They want you to keep the fires burning and the lights on, but they're not quite sure about what you should receive in return. And some people get uncomfortable whenever they see the ministers of God providing for their family or, or purchasing something that's a necessity or a comfort even for their life. But I want you to see this morning that that kind of attitude, that that kind of spirit is actually in direct opposition to what the Word of God says about what the ministers are entitled to. This is what I'm talking about. Let's, let, we'll look at one more example here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up now. But I'm going to give you a biblical example of what I'm talking about, this kind of attitude, and we see it right in the Bible. Let's look at something that was going on in the Corinthian church and what the Apostle Paul had to say about it. Now, uh, this next passage I don't have on the slide, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it word for word. It's 14, about 14 verses long, okay? But it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Write that down, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. I'm, it'll bless you for you to take that home and read that for homework, if you will. Let's call it homework. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 14. Because there's a lot of good stuff in here, right along the lines of what I'm, what I'm talking about. But a summary of these 14 verses is basically that the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And for the first half of that chapter 9, he's reminding them that they do, in fact, have an obligation to support their ministers. And he's spending half of that chapter trying to remediate this indifference that they seem to have about paying the ministry. And after clearly pointing out that God has given he himself, Paul's saying, the, a right to be supported by them, in this chapter you'll see God decide, Paul decides that nevertheless, even though God has given me the right, and even though you ought to be doing this, he says, I've decided not to take wages of you because I don't want to offend you. I've decided I'm not going to take wages of you because I don't want to hinder you. The gospel in you. They had such a rotten attitude. They had such an immature attitude that Paul says, I can't even treat you like I do the rest of the churches. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you get the impression that the Corinthian church, like I said before, oh, they were enjoying. Paul founded this church. He was the founder of the church at Corinth. 
and he was continuing to minister them. And you get the impression they were certainly enjoying the benefit of his ministry. And they wanted to con- him to continue being the, their apostle. But they were, you get the impression that they were becoming stingy and critical. Paul says, you have those that are examining me. You're examining what I eat. You're examining, you want to examine every little dollar I spend. You're worried about what brand of sandals I'm wearing. He don't say that, but that's the impression that you're getting. You see, they had this, well, y'all know what I'm talking about. You ever know somebody that was so sensitive or immature about something that when you got around them, you felt like you couldn't even talk like you normally talk around people? Like you kind of had to walk on eggshells, otherwise you'd offend them or upset them. This seems to be the way that Paul felt with the Corinthian church when it came to this topic of supporting himself with their tithes. And it was because of their spiritual immaturity. It was because of the erroneous ideas that they had. Now, do you think this was a good thing for the Corinthian church? I've heard people point out this passage of Scripture right here and say, See, Paul, Paul didn't take the tithes from the Corinthian church, see? Do you think that was a positive example? No, it's not. In fact, we don't have to speculate. We can, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 7, and 9. We're almost done. In fact, Paul himself lets us know later on. He's writing in 2 Corinthians 11, 7, and 9, and he gives us the impression that maybe he made a mistake in not requiring them to support his ministry. This is good. This is good. This is very applicable to us because we, we're dealing with this kind of stuff right now in this church age. 2 Corinthians 11, 7, and 9, Paul's writing to those same people, and he said, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Because I preached to you the gospel of God freely. Did I make a mistake in doing that? Verse 8, I robbed other churches taking wages of them in order to do you service. Other churches were paying their tithes. Look at that. Other churches were meeting their obligation to the ministry. And Paul says, the unfortunate thing is I had to go to other churches in order to feed you. A healthy church, the Corinthian church was. They were, it, was a, it was not a small city. It was not a small church. We, get, we know this based on the demographic of the city. Verse 9, and when I was present with you and I wanted, I needed something, I was chargeable to none of you, but instead the things that I lacked, another church. Look at this. The brethren from Macedonia came and supplied it to me. My goodness. Another church was paying the Corinthian church's bills because of their attitude, because of their spirit. And in all things, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will I continue to keep myself. This is not a positive example of how a church should be, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, But if any man provide not for his own... And especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than infidel. If we could stand to our feet, I'm closing. If any man does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We don't want to be a church or a people that does not take care of our own house, that does not take care, amen, that does not take care of our own. We don't want to be the type of people that shirk away from our biblical and spiritual responsibilities. So let's continue to be faithful in bringing God the tithes. And we must understand that what God is going to do with them is what the Bible says He's going to do with them. He's going to give it to the five-fold ministry to support them while they're doing His work, while they're serving you. While they're serving the church. Amen. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise and magnify the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Can we just raise our voice, lift our voice to our King and Savior? Reading from the book of Psalm, reading Psalm 150. says this, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Has He been mighty to anybody here? Praise Him for His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with a psaltery and harp. Praise Him with a timbrel and dance. Praise Him with string instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. And He concludes it. 
to ensure he hadn't let anybody out. To let everything that hath breath. Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Can we do that for a moment? Can we just praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Can we just magnify His name? Hallelujah. Because when you praise the Lord, you make an avenue, you make a roadway, you make a conduit to anything can happen in the presence of God. When God is in this place, you welcome Him with praise. And it makes everything possible. Amen? You need something impossible to be worked out in your life today? You want to open that passageway to God? Praise Him. He inhabits that praise. He makes His throne upon the praise that you give our God. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no Stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. There is no weapon that is ever left a mark on you. And there is no the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. Show me one thing you can do. Show me a mountain you can move. He's the God of the prayer. And anything is possible Show me one thing that's too hot Show me waters he can't pop He's the God of the breakthrough And anything is possible It's possible There is a kingdom That's advancing at the speed
Anybody going through something this morning? We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. This is the right atmosphere for prayer. Amen. We're going to remember Sister Linda Brown. She needs healing in her body. Sister Barbara Sims also needs a touch. And Sister Marie Boyd had surgery th Thursday. And we need to continue to pray for her. We also need to pray for Marcia McNeil, who's um, dealing with cancer. Sister Harper, uh, dealing with an issue in her lungs that she needs healing. Brother Tyrone Walker needs health and recovery from an illness. And also Liam McDowell, we need to continue to pray for, for his eyes. We also need to pray for um, Sister Lakeisha Moore. She's having some, left, uh, some pain in her left hip this morning. And also there's a, a one-year-old baby named Noel who is in the hospital um, in Nevada. And we're going to pray that God would touch him as well. We also need to remember our new converts. The moment that you're born again of the water and the spirit, the enemy unleashes attacks on you. He had no reason to attack before, so we need to, to keep them lifted up in our prayers. Amen? In John chapter 6 and verse 66 says, From that time many of his disciples, they went back and they walked no more with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and we have come to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Everything was, was good when the miracles were happening. But the moment they started to go through something, I always remember pastors saying, if you haven't been through nothing with God, you can't say anything about God. And these men began to get, Jesus began to preach some weightier matters to them. But they had a, a back, backup plan that they were holding on to. And when the moment was right, they fell back to the fallback option. But Peter and the rest of the disciples said, we don't have anywhere else to go. We know the report of the doctor. We see what's going on in our, in our finances. We know that we're moving from place to place. We know people have rejected us for what we believe, but we don't have anywhere else to go. You have exactly what we, I wonder if anybody here this morning has come to a point, if you can signify it by the uplifting of your hands, God's going to touch you right where you are. If you've come to a place and you say, I don't have anywhere else to go. I've relinquished every other option that I have. I've tried long enough to fix it my own way, but this morning you have what I need. Come on, would you lift your hands this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning with faith. We come with expectation. Even better, we come anticipating that the way that I came this morning, the way that I'm feeling right now, what I'm going through in the moment, is not going to stay that way. We lift every prayer before you this morning. Those needing a touch of healing in their body. God, those with financial difficulties. Those that are going through things. God, we pray for a touch that can only come from you. Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can I go? You've got the words of eternal life. If you've got my eternity taken care of, then I know I can trust you for my present. So tonight we pray this morning, Father, that you would touch and minister in the name of Jesus. Speak to our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Hidden glory. 
It's been said that if a man's religion doesn't affect his use of money, that man's religion is in vain. Next to the subject of God himself, the subject of finance is spoken of more often in Scripture than any other topic. Sixteen of the Lord's 38 parables deal with money. In the New Testament, more said about money than the topics of heaven and hell combined. Four times more is said about money than prayer. And while there are over 500 verses that deal with prayer and faith, there are over 2,000 verses that deal with money and possessions. Did you know that Jesus actually watches who gives, how much they give, and the spirit with which they give? Oh, yeah. Let me read that to you. I'm going to prove it. Mark chapter 12, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld, he watched, how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in. He was counting. Anybody listening to me? Jesus was counting how much they put into the treasury. That this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Pastor, why is God so concerned about how we handle our money? Because how we handle our money reveals what we truly love. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is a root of all evil. Some assume that means dollars and cents. No, it's not just dollars and cents. The love of money is a reference to the love of getting or the love of gain or the love of more. It's not getting or gain or more that's wrong. It's the love of getting or gain or more. The love of money, the love of getting, the love of gain <clears throat> is the root of all evil. We find the antithesis of that over in the book of John. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he did just the opposite. If the love of money, the love of getting, the love of gain, the love of more is the root of all evil, what is the root of all good? The love of giving. But God so loved, he gave. Let the ushers come. That's why the greatest characteristic of love is giving. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Let's make an investment in our eternal life today, shall we? Somebody say amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privilege that we have to give. Thank you because you set the example for giving when you gave it all away on Calvary. Now you've blessed us, Lord Jesus, with the ability to give. Some have much, some have little, but we can all give, Lord, of what we have. And we know that you look upon what we have and what we give. You look upon our desire, our intention. And I pray, Lord Jesus, you would examine our intentions today. And the love, Lord Jesus, measure it. When you measure how much we give, measure our love, Lord Jesus. Because even though some may not have much, we have much love for you. And we give out of an abundance of our love for you. Bless the gift and the giver as we give this morning. In Jesus' name.
the time we have today. I want you to turn your attention to the book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. The book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. Uh, if you had, are all able to stand for honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. Uh, some of you have not received your daily reading this week. I'm going to give you enough to last you at least today. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 1. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, I'm sure the media team will have it for you. So 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shaco, which belongeth or sits inside Judah, and pitched between Shaco and Ezekiah at Ephesus Demine, and Saul and the men of Israel gathered together. They gathered together and pitched a tent in the valley of Eli and set the battle in array. They began to stir up trouble against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a great valley between them. And there went out, there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and span, and he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had a, a greaves of brass about his legs and a target of brass about his shoulder, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him and stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out? Set your battle in array. Am I not a Philistine? And ye, servants of Saul, choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will, be, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said... I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard those words of Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Someone say afraid. Now David, now, now David was the son of the Ephraite, the, uh, the Bethlehem, uh, the Bethlehem, Judah, I'm sorry, Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the men uh, went among them for an old man in the days of Saul. I want to preach this topic today with the help of the Lord. When you help today, invaded praise, invaded praise. Won't you put your Bibles down? I know we're short of time. Won't you put your Bibles down? Won't you raise your hands toward heaven right now? And let's ask God to be with us today. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I thank you for the rich word. I thank you for the life that have already, that's already been born into you today. Lord, I thank you for the baptism that's already taken place. But I pray right now. I come against the spirit of distraction that may want to creep in the house. I pray that you hold our minds and our hearts ransom through the throne room of God that we may receive a word from you today. I pray right now that you anoint my mind, that you give me clarity of thought, precision of speech as I give your word today. Break up the fallow ground that this anointed word finds good soil, Lord. I thank you that you are fighting for us, Lord. I thank you that you are still God on the throne. I thank you that you have not forgotten about us, Lord. And I thank you that you've called us to be more than an overcomer. Come on, can someone give God a shout of praise for the Lord? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Look at your neighbor and tell him invaded praise. You may be seated. You may be seated. In our scripture text, Shako is used to translate the Hebrew word pronounced Shako, which means fenced in or bushy edge. The Bible says to mark those who cause division. Hmm. See, if you don't understand or if you have been hiding in a cave somewhere, have you maybe got a smoke flare that this world is hell-bent on causing division? Everywhere you go, somebody is trying to stir something up you got a mask, stay away. You don't have a mask, you're the devil. You're, you're this color, you're this race, you came from this daddy, this mom. 
We live in a, a very divided world, but where uh, there should never be division is, is in the house of God. I, 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 know, I know this world would like to tell you that it's everywhere, but it, it should never be in the body of Christ because he came to all. He, I'm thankful that God looked beyond my problems and looked beyond my situations. I don't know if you know it or not, but none of us deserve the mercies and the grace of God. I am thankful. I am thankful that he is not a high priest that he cannot be touched with the feelings of my infirmity. I am thankful that when the world told me that it's a divided front that I can't touch God. I am thankful when I could not be like him. He became like me so I can be like him. You ought to thank God that when you could not reach his lofty heights, he became the theanthropist. He became the God man. So in 2021, when the world wants to tell you you're isolated and you can't touch, you may tell you what, you always have a phone call to heaven. It doesn't matter if it's just you by yourself, baby, or you're in a coast and a host of people. You better get your best praise on and your best worship on and not let the devil divide you and what God has in store for your home. This world wants to invade your praise, but there needs to be a church of today that says, I will not back down. I will not shut up. I will not hold my peace any longer. I'm going to give God the praise. How many is thankful that he's worthy of your praise? Shako, a divided edge. It's amazing how precise, Brother Ritter, Excellent Bible study this morning. Papa Shepherd used to say, people show sure act funny when they get a little money. But divided edge. It was very precise at where they picked their battlefield. Because if the enemy cannot cause to divide you, he will do his next thing. Ezekiel, the other town that it bordered, means to dig up. If the enemy cannot divide you, he will dig up something about you. If the devil cannot dig up, divide you from the body of Christ, if he cannot cause a wedge between you and your brother, he will try to slander. I don't know about you, but I've got some skeletons in my closet that I ain't too proud, proud about. And even though God delivered me, even though God saved me, even though I'm not the man that I, I used to be because he called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you're having a down moment, it doesn't take the devil long to say, hey, he's down. Let me kick him and let me remind him of what he used to be. And it doesn't take long before you begin believing the report of the devil instead of believing the report of the Lord that I've called you out of darkness. You're no longer a sinner, but I've saved you by my, I know it don't make sense. I know you may not understand it today, but let me tell you if the church can get a beachhead, a beachfront on praise and not surrender, not give up, the devil has to flee. Don't let division come in, don't let the devil dig up stuff about you. It doesn't matter what the world has to say about you, it matters what God has to say about you. How many is thankful that God stepped in your past to define your present? How many is thankful that you don't deserve the blessings of God, but He He loved you anyway. (laughs) Satan will make an investment in your yesterday to defeat your tomorrow. Some of you need to put that in your Bible right now. Satan will make an investment. Have you you realized that once you get a breakthrough, every devil in hell, every backslider, every family member. Maybe I'm preaching to those in California. Let me look at them real quick. I don't know about here, brother, but, but, but Sam Bernardino, every once in a while, the wheels come off. Did you see, Pastor, she looked at me funny. Well, she's blind, and you were halfway across the audience, so I don't think that really mattered anything. But, but how many understands that your mind can play tricks on you? Tell you things that's not even true. But there's one person, there's one thing, there's one mirror that we've got to look into every night of our life. I know you sleep with you. How many, mind, how many your mind takes a break on you at the middle of the night? Nah. What does that mind keep doing? It keeps running on. And you try to reel it back in, but it just keeps running on. And, 
And all of a sudden, the devil begins to tell you, I know God has told you you're going to be doing great and mighty things, and, but really you just had too much pizza last night to, but, because you can't perform because, you know what, your daddy and mama, they didn't have anything to do. You don't have a heritage in this. You don't have a, a legacy in this. You've, you've gone too far. You've done too much, and your mind will begin to play tricks on you, and it began to dig up things in your mind, and all of a sudden you say, man, the devil may be right. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm good for nothing. I, I just might as well lay here and die, but let me tell you, as Pastor said, while ago he did not come from the wealths of heaven to the slums of this earth to to save you just to remain in your mess i know there's a church on every corner that wants to tell you that you can live however you want and god will accept you at eh, wrong answer by another vow the bible says that if he called me out of darkness to his marvelous light i have no business going back to those dark places and if he's got enough to save me, he's got enough to keep me. He's got enough to deliver. How many ex-alcoholics and drug addicts in the how many of you are bound by depression? But yes, yeah, save Jesus. He came down and he smiled on you, and you've got your right mind. You have a praise for God, not because of you, but because of the God you serve. <laughs> Satan will make an investment in your yesterday. The enemy wants to dig up. He wants to keep you where you are so we may never become what God has purposed us to be. In this setting, in this battlefield, in this placement of this battle, more than how strategic the placement of the battle, I don't know if you know it or not, but the devil always knows seemingly when and where to show up. You're struggling. And that one thing, I don't know what you're struggling with, but everybody struggle with something. That one thing, you having a bad day, and that one person shows up. You had not seen in years. And all of a sudden, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. See? Out of all of the places that they could have chosen to, to gather their armies, they, they chose Shako, which is in, in Judah. Judah, in the Hebrew word, as we all know, it means praise. But however, it comes from a larger word uh, called Yadala He, Yadala He, Yadala, Yada, Y A D H, Yada, means to praise or to extend your hands and give thanks. Yada. I'm going to yada. Y-A-D-A-H. I'm going to yada God today. I'm going to praise God today. But the root word, which means hand or power, yada, or dominion. You cannot praise God and not get power. You cannot walk into the house of God not worrying about your checkbook, not worrying. If they're going to get your car, they're going to get you anyway. You might as well praise God. Well, that don't happen here, right? <laughs> San Bernardino, they may pull up in the church parking lot every once in a while. But I got some crazy folks. They go like, no, I'm going to get it tomorrow. You ain't getting it today anyway. They're going to foreclose yesterday. The only hope that you and I have is in Jesus. The only hope is if I walk into the house of God, I left my junk in the car. I came into the house of God to lift up holy hands to a holy God because I need his power. I need his authority to move on. Yada, yada. The second root word for yada. Yada, Y-A-D-A, -A, yada, to know or to become intimate, yada. This secondary root word of yada, it kind of got me scratching my head because I've already always known got, that yada meant praise, but the root word of even that root word meant to be intimate. The word denotes intimacy in relationship. Adam knew Eve. Oh, man. Abraham knew Sarah. You cannot have true praise and true worship without having a true relationship. <laughs> and that relationship begins to get you pregnant 
with purpose. And if you're pregnant with purpose, you're going to guard it like a mother guards it. If every man and every woman in the house of God, if God has given you a promise, I don't care how far gone your backslidden son and daughter are, if God, oh, if God's given you a promise, you carry that child with promise and thank God that you had an intimate time with him. And in the cool of the night, he told you not what you used to be, but he told you what you could be. I know your family's a deadbeat nobody Body, but I've called you out of that and I've made you my own. I've made your sons and daughters and you no longer, you no longer have to be defeated. You no longer have to be down and out. You need to make sure every time you have, the doors are open, you need to come in. God, I praise you. What, what, I, what they've told me is, Pastor, if I, I, I can't really praise at home. Even synergy, I'm thankful. For the body of Christ. Because there's been times I've been down and somebody's had to tell me, Pastor, we're praying for you. And I know we're fighting together. But Sister Wilson, it's, it's amazing when you're in your own home where it should be a house of prayer and you don't feel comfortable. There's something wrong with the church that you can't worship God on a computer screen or in the the devil has invaded the praise of the people. Let me tell you, your best weapon is to praise God anywhere you can. Your best weapon and your best assault is to give God praise no matter what the world says. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hold my coat a minute. I got to praise God. Not because of everything going good, but because my God is still a, a good God to me. How many thank God that he's still blessing you. He's still loving you. He's still restoring you. How about somebody give God a high praise right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for great teachers like Pastor Shepherd and my grandmother and others that have graced this pulpit and men of God that have gone by, that have been in my life, great ministers, great laborers and women that have labored in, uh, with, with, with vigor and with a tenacity. And the church lays today dictated by the world and has allowed the world to be the spiritual thermostat in our life. Let me tell you, you want to know why you're still struggling? Because the world has their hand on your thermostat. How about the church of God? You don't care how hot it is, devil bring it on. I'm com You want to know how your marriage begins to come back together again? You want to know how your relationships begin to unfold? You want to know how that you're, I know you're fighting depression and you're fighting oppression. You want to know how to be an overcomer? You ought to get your best praise on. It's hard to be depressed when you're worshiping God. It's hard to have an anxiety attack when you're giving your care. When you're casting your cares upon him because he cares for you. Let me tell you that the one place that you ought to have liberty is in the house of God. And if you're landlocked, if you're locked up in your mind, that's not the pastor's fault. That's not the ministry's fault. That's not your, that's not your neighbor's fault. You know what? It don't even matter who's in the, who's in, who's in the office. It don't matter. At the end of the day, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And I'm not waiting to get over there before I shout and dance. I want God to know I hear today that he's been good to me. I need him to know right now, like Job said, though he slay me. I'm still going to trust him. Let me tell you today, today may you'll be your darkest hour. The enemy may be encamped around about you, but you know what you need to tell the devil? You need to tell the devil just like Jesus did. See, Jesus, he settled praise after he had fasted. In Matthew 4 and 9, I don't have time to read it. But in Matthew 4 and 9, Jesus has been fasting and praying in the wilderness. And that old sly serpent, like I said, he knows when to get you. You know, you go, you go on a two-day fast and all of a sudden everybody's having rib day. Thank you, brother. I'm coming back to work next week. Hallelujah. Everybody, come, we, we going out to eat today. My treat. You think, maybe I'll fast next week. But didn't that, didn't that way to happen? 
That's just like the devil. That, your brother and sister not the devil, don't be. That crazy pastor from California told me I call you the devil. I didn't say that. But the devil came. He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'm going to give you everything that you see. And Jesus said this thing. And saith unto him, all these things will I give you if they'll fall down and worship me. But then Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, it is written, it is written. It's not a fairy tale. It's not something I saw on social media. It's not my neighbor. It's the word of God. Then it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Let me tell you, too many people are worshiping the problem. I'm sick in my body and all of a sudden they begin to shut down. Just a little friction in the home, and they began to file divorce papers. All of a sudden, the kids go just a little crazy. I know we're no crazy kids around here, huh? And all of a sudden, we're giving up on them. We're throwing them out. We, we're throwing it, we're cashing in the check, and God's word isn't true. Because you're praising the problem and saying prayer isn't the one. That's the God of the problem. So you got to do like Jesus did, and you got to say, hey, it's not about me. It's about, it's about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's about the one that's high and mighty and his train. It fills the temple. Let me tell you, if your life is filled with Jesus, it don't have problems. I don't believe that, Pastor, because I still have problems. I didn't say problems wouldn't come. But problems will not affect you. Problems will not penetrate a true worshiper. In the scripture text, it's, 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 a, it's a like, and I, I know I'm rushed up, but it's just like David appears out of nowhere. This scripture text, it's, it's a really just a history lesson. Samuel is just a history lesson of, of what was going on in Israel at the time. So it was more of a history lesson than a prophetic lesson. And it's kind of odd because all of a sudden Samuel breaks up the, the poetic monotony, if I may, of the text. In verse 12, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's talking about the battle. He's talking about Goliath. And all of a sudden, J uh, Samuel interjects, now David. Now David. See, I love this word now. Because this word now is the only thing that supersedes time, space, continuing. See, if he would have said, then David, which honestly, since it's a historical text, he should have said, then David, because we're reading about it in the past. But the scripture, it's like the man of God knew that if I put then David, this text will forevermore be stuck in Sunday school around cookies and Kool-Aid. But he used now because now is a word that three seconds from now is still... <laughs> A year from now is still. Now is a word, as an eternal word that never, ever ends. So this word, if you would have put then David, this text would only involve David. But he says now David. So what that means is I have a now David moment. Now faith is a substance. Jesus. Now substance of things. Hope for the evidence. It's tangible of things not seen. I am thankful for a now moment. Now David comes from nowhere to face this bully. Coming home is always a challenge. When I went to Smith Station. I was a short, fat kid, fifth grade. Sister Wendy will tell you. We went to the same school. And there was... if. He's in here. I've forgiven you. But there was this kid, because I was just a short, fat kid. Just short, fat thing. I know most of you remember. Tater head, that's what they call me. Thank you. But they, they should always, the bullies will always come because I was pickable, they would say. Some of you bullies out there smiling, you're thinking, oh, man, I'd have picked on you too. So they would pick on me, and they, it would never fail. The only good, pe only good day at school at lunch was pizza day. They would always come to my table, and they'd put their big finger in the middle of my pizza. And look, and of course, I didn't really need to eat any more pizza, but I really wanted to eat some pizza <laughs> on my terms. And 
day in, day out, stuffed in trash cans. Day in and day out, made fun of and laughed at because, you know, my mommy said, everybody liked me. And I've been told everyone loves me. I don't understand what's going on right now because I don't feel too loved. And like a light bulb at the playground, it wasn't Carlos Moffat, but it was Jeff, came and he took my ball away from me. And I said, I'm tired of being pushed around. Now, let me tell you, I would love to tell you that I whooped him all over the yard. That is not the case that happened. He strung me up from one side to the next. But I never had another problem again. I was still short, fat, and dumpy. But I never had a problem again. Because I was sick of being kicked on. I was sick of being picked on. And something got a hold of me. And David was kind of that runtly kind of guy that was on the backwoods. He was the special guy that his brother made fun of because all he did was play his little heart. But little know that when man, thank you, brother, I'm not sure who gave uh, announcements. He talked about the rejected. When the world rejected David, they did not know that God had already selected him for something greater. And the world has rejected you and the world has turned their back on you. Some of you, you're out here and your family, they don't like you here in this church because it's a different church and they've rejected you. But little do they know that even though that man has rejected you, God has selected you for such a time as this. 2021 is not a year that's going to be like any other because the, because the body of Christ needs to come together with one mind, with one accord, and say, I refuse to die in this valley. I refuse to be depressed another day. I refuse to go down in life again. But I, today, I choose to be on God's side, and God has selected you. It's no accident. It's not by coincidence you're here today. You're here to have a divine encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord. Lord of Lords, you want your life to be set straight, you put your feet in the hands of God and let God guide you. But this bully, this bully, this bully came, threatening. See, Goliath, it's a different sort. Goliath, we've all learned about him in Sunday school. Goliath, of Gath, big burly guy. But I don't find in record recorded anywhere that Goliath actually participated in any warfare where he used his, his spear or his sword. They wheeled him out. And I couldn't figure out why. Surely this man has to have something that would say, I, I slew that man. I have these victories. But he's accredited with victories. In more research, I found out that Goliath and his family were from a lineage and a line of soothsayers. Sound like the devil. So all, all Goliath really knew was what to say to them to get them to cower down and not step out by faith. Goliath was good at shooting off at the mouth but wasn't really good and having corn in the crib. And here's what I love about David. David, he was just a little too dumb to know. He had just been kicked by his brothers. He'd been rejected by his dad. His father even said, no, not that one. It's surely not that one. It's bad when your own daddy rejects you. Even the man of God says, are you sure this is the man? But here's the beautiful thing. Only God can put up and only God can put down. So you're looking at your boss to give you the raise when you shouldn't be looking at your God. To Your boss signs it, but God okays it. You're, 
You're, you, we we got to make sure we understand in the heat of the battle that God is in control. And if we do not realize that with every fiber of our body and we do not continue to look at our great ancestors that continue to be faithful to God and God continue to be faithful to them, we'll think that it, this was a past tense, but it's not a past tense. It's a right now tense that God is still moving today. And if God's still moving today, it's the same for this year and the next year and the next year and the next generation and the next generation. But there's got to be some that will come out of obscurity, out of the will and say I know I'm not I know I may not be much I know I'm from nothing but God use this vessel use this brokenness and let God establish you and let God no let God take you to another level Jesus David 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 is an example to me in my life because there's been times where I, I've been on the backwoods and I really didn't fit in with anybody I really didn't know I didn't really understand I and I just I just questioned God and now faith. Have you ever been to a point in life where the now faith really didn't feel right to you? It was now someone else's faith. Now someone else's blessing. The giants in your life will not stop coming until you solve the problem of praise. You've got to do it immediately. You can't delay any longer. You've been doing it by yourself for too long. That's why you're a mess. How many messes are in the house? I'll be honest. I'm a I'm a mess. But God, in his infinite mercy, has a way of bringing the best out of you if you allow him to bring the best out of you. I've been pastoring this great church in San Bernardino. It's a legacy church. I'm very honored to pastor it. But when I was voted in six years ago, almost seven years ago now, my first month, very first month, I was hit with three lawsuits that were pending before I became pastor, but they all hit my very first month of pastorate. One was for $6.1 million. The other was over thousand dollars All frivolous lawsuits, but it would expend everything that we had to take care of these lawsuits. And I was at my wit's end, and a roof needed to be repaired, on and on, the joys of ownership, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. And not two months later, in walks a beautiful organization called the IRS. I didn't get just one agent. I got a van load of nine agents that all came in. Little did I know that our little bitty church somehow wound up on this list of churches to be checked on, put it that way. How in the world? And I'm thinking, God, I thought we were about to do great things together. I was feeling like San Bernardino was about to be turned upside down. That's what I was feeling. But now I don't really feel that anymore. The enemy was on the outside, on the outside, and they were taunting and laughing. Within six months, within six months, I was told I was going to go blind. I would not see. Just a month or two later, my wife and I... My wife, not myself, but my wife was pregnant with our fourth child. And they told us that she had Down syndrome. That crushed me. Here I am trying to serve, trying to love. I, I, I fold in my business. I'm, I'm invested in the church. I'm, I'm doing all that I can. But now it feels like God left me on the battlefield to die. Day in and day out. I don't know if you've ever been mad at God, but I was mad at God. See, we have this false persona that you can't be mad at God. It's okay. God doesn't need Prozac. The Bible says he knows the desires of your heart, so you might as well tell him so he, you can get on the table and work it out. I'm just that kind of man. I may, it may not be different to you, but I just told God, hey, God, I've got a problem with this. This is not what I signed on for. And God said, buck up. <laughs> Felt that check in my spirit. So I went to church, put a smile on my face, and preached the best that I could preach. But after seven months, seven months, the, our church that God has blessed me to pastor is a revival church. There's new souls every day. We're baptized. God is blessing. But seven months, not one person not one person in a new converts class. I'm being transparent because I'm just telling you how loud it will get 
not one person. Because the devil had me so distracted by everything else. that Anybody's ever been distracted by everything else? And you forget the one thing, the one thing I desire, the one thing, this one thing. And it didn't take long. And I was crying out on a Monday night prayer meeting. And I kind of felt like, I kind of felt like, why hast thou forsaken me? You've ever felt that way before? Moses said this. He felt like God was trying to kill him. Amen? So as I'm praying and fasting, feeling God's further than he's ever been before. I'm standing in line at Stater Brothers, which is the grocery store that's right next to my house, which unfortunately is right next to the church. So on Tuesday night, if I need to get milk, if I get it after church, I'm there all night long. Because the whole church is there, praise the Lord. But seven months has gone by. These lawsuits, we're, in, we're about to lose the church. And it's, it's not looking good. Not, and it's just uh, the devil is just attacking. And we're on all of these. Just in case you know, the world doesn't want the church to succeed. I don't know if you knew that or not. Because uh, they're after your praise. They're after what's in the house of God. The deliverance, the, the saving power, the, the message. And they were after what God was about to do. And you know what? It got in my head. It got in my mind. And even though I've come from good stock, and I'm thankful for a grandmother that had six inches of her backbone that praying saints that were here and by faith believing she walked out of the hospital bed praying I'm thankful for the heritage that I have but you know what I didn't feel that God was a now God to me I felt I was a yesterday and I felt that I was all by myself but all of a sudden in Stater Brothers when I was mad at God I was probably grumbling underneath my breath why do I got to get milk right now why she didn't get it earlier today I just want to go home I just want to I don't want to talk to anybody I want to do it The little checker lady's checking out groceries, and I'm closing. She's checking out. And all of a sudden, she stops checking, and the line is long. And you know at night, they close every register but one, so it's 50 people in one line. And I'm not at the back, but I'm close to the back. Because our church is close to there, most of the cashiers and whatnot know that I'm a pastor because my saints, they see me, and we talk all the time. So this checker's checking, and she stops, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking, what's going on? I'm really wanting to get home. I, I got to go. I'm done with the day. I'm done. And all of a sudden, I hear that man back, that man back there is a pastor. And immediately, my carnal flesh. I was like, oh, Lord. Please. And I started looking around. Where's the pastor? Who? And all of a sudden, I started seeing the lady at the check. Now, this place is packed. The lady in line, she's crying. Now, God has not, in my mind, answered one prayer for me. My church is still falling apart. We still haven't baptized anybody. I think God has forsaken me. I'm ready to go try to mission field somewhere. And they said, he's a pastor. And something rose up in me. I was going to ignore it, but God said, are you going to stand up? I didn't know what that meant. But something in me said, you've got to do this thing. And as the lady called me, and all of a sudden it begins to part, and I've been walking up front, the lady began to cry right there in the checkout line with all these people right there. And the lady said, this lady needs prayer. She just lost her children in an accident. And tonight, she was clean for 15 years, but tonight she used heroin, and she's going to be on the streets. And she doesn't know where to turn. And when I looked back at you, I said, that man of God can help you. And I didn't think I could help. I couldn't even help myself. But in the checkout line, she looked at me with tears in her eyes, makeup streaming. She said, Pastor, will you pray for me? And I was convicted in my spirit. And if she was bold enough, Brother Wilson, to ask me for a prayer in line in front of all these people, I better be bold enough to pray for her right then and there. I'm crazy like that anyway, usually, but I was on a bad day. I know you've never had those before. But as I laid my hands on her head and at Stater Brothers parking lot, she began to receive the power of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues at a checkout line. Oh, in a checkout line. But what would have happened if I let the enemy back me into a corner and tell me that I'm nothing tell me I'm insignificant tell me you're defeated when God just wants you to
stand up. Stand up for what you believe. Stand up for what God has invested in you. And you got to stand up and you got to give him praise, not because of the trial, not because of the situation, but because he's God. Lisa, not leave you hanging. Within a matter of two weeks, the, every, every, every lawsuit folded. The one bitter lady that was suing the most came and cried at my feet and apologized. Let me tell you. Sunday morning, actually Saturday night, I got a phone call from my ladies in the church. She said, Pastor, I want to bring a family with me tomorrow to church. And I'm like, well, praise God, bring them on. We haven't had new people in a while. I'm thinking, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, she began to whisper. I was like, sister, what's wrong? She's like, well, let me go somewhere I can talk. She said, they are from an Indian cult tribe of Aztec Indians, and uh, her mom was a witch, and they practice, but they want these spirits to be gone. They're tired of living this life. Their children are cutting themselves, and it's, they want to get out, but I don't know what to do. Should I bring them? I said, yes, bring them to the house of God, and I was preaching, so I knew I'd keep, so the whole time I'm preaching, they still on the left-hand side, and the whole time I'm preaching, they began to file in three rows rows of new people file in <laughs> two weeks after i prayed for the lady that stayed brothers because i stood up by faith and as they, she stood up music is going on i go to read my text i open my text i begin to preach i wasn't in the message five minutes the mother stood up began to cry and she was crying and she just began to weep and all of a sudden i stopped preaching i walked over the pews i laid my hand on her head and she began to speak in tongues i looked at her husband then all of a sudden nobody was touching him and he was speaking in tongues right then and there let me tell you if you'll stand up god will stand up for you you don't know what god's called you for you don't know what the devil's trying to fight against but God has selected you for I could ramble all day but I'm not going to Monday night prayer was the next night Monday night prayer Monday night Monday and Monday, Monday night prayer I'm in prayer and I'm praying on the platform back and forth like I normally do because I kind of got you know I can't stay still praise the Lord so I'm passing back and forth, and all of a sudden, Monday night prayer, they come filing in, and they brought 14 more people with them on a Monday night prayer. I baptized six on Sunday. I baptized nine on Monday. Let me tell you, if you'll stand up and say, God, I give you praise, God will begin to rain down on your situation. God will begin, I don't care about COVID. I don't care about problems. I don't care about politics. I don't care about all of that. All I know is that he died so I can have. Let me tell you this. By God's grace and mercy, God's allowed us to double in five years. And it's not about the numbers. But God just had to take me to a place of nothing so I can understand that even though you feel rejected, you understand in your darkest hour, I've selected you for something greater. Last testimony, if they could put the slide up. My baby girl, the doctor, we went scan after scan after scan. We were seeing grief counselors. They were putting our home like it should for a child with Down syndrome to be able to get around the house and to be able to, to function. And we began to, they began to tell, oh, Jesus, they began to tell us. And all of a sudden, on the last day, on the last week, I should say, on a Friday before they began to, uh, to induce labor on my wife to follow. And we, we went in for one last scan. Now, that we've already had like nine scans before, brother. But all of a sudden, the doctor took a long time coming out this last day. After about two hours longer than we should have been there, the doctor walks in. He was in to shuffle his papers. He didn't know what to say, Brother Vidal. And I said, is the baby okay? Is something wrong? And he said, well, Pastor, here are the scans. And he began to lay the scans out. These actually were seven scans. Here are the seven scans. 
But we have this one anonym, anomaly on this one here. Evidently, this, this, the computer is miscalibrated on this one, and we would like to scan your wife again because it doesn't match the other seven. I said, we ain't scanning her again. She ain't getting another test made because you know what? I stood up, and my God is a healer, and my God is a rewarder, and my baby girl just celebrated her sixth birthday, healthy as can be. Why? Because I refuse to lay down and die. I chose to stand up. Now, I don't know what you're comfortable with today, and they're going to sing, and they're going to shout, and they're going to give you some good music to dance with. Well, Pastor, Brother McLean, I don't do all that stuff. I wish I had a camera on you during football Sunday. Sorry, that meant for San Bernardino. My, I'm sorry. Sorry. San Bernardino, uh, yeah. Uh, but what would happen if the church would be infected with true worshipers that can worship him in spirit and in truth. What's the truth? The truth is that he died that I can have. What's the truth? The truth is that he went down to death, hell, and the grave that he conquered so today I can worship him. I don't have to worry about the mess. My God has that in the palm of his hand. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know what your situation is, but if you'll stand up right now and begin to worship God and thank God for doing it in your life, he is going to bring you out. Somebody lift your hands toward heaven and worship God. Come on. Come on. You can't shut me up. Oh, you can't back me down. I've got a praise. I've got to get it out. I've got too many miracles. I've, I've got too many blessings to back down from. Man of God can't do it for you. You got to get up and you got to do it for yourself.